In a course on mass spectrometry, we really can't get away with the fact that we have to talk about chromatography. So I'm not sure how much background you have on that topic. I'm just going to go through it very briefly here because the connection between LCMS and GCMS is extremely important. All right, let's talk about gas chromatography first. So here's the basic instrumental setup, and it's quite simple. The big box over there, that's just an oven. Uh, and of course, you've got a tank of gas. So the gas is what's going to push our sample through the oven. Inside the oven, we have this column. So that's really what's going to separate our compound. How do our analytes get in? Well, usually, even though this is gas chromatography, our analyte starts off as a liquid. So they don't have to be just gases. Anything that can evaporate, that can go into the gas phase, is suitable for gas chromatography. So imagine here that we're just injecting a very small quantity, like a microliter. We might not even put all that sample in, so you saw it being split. That was just heated on its way through. Now the sample is going to travel down this really long column. The column might be like 100 meters long, and the inside of it has a coating that allows for a different retention. So some analytes stick to that surface and others not so much. So as the analytes are blown through that column, you notice that some of them have a head start. Some of them are gaining on the others. They tend to sort of cluster up like that, and you end up with the separation that you're, that you're achieving. So if we put a mass spectrometer on the back end of that, then the mass spectrometer would be detecting those compounds one by one. So what you would see here would actually be what we call a chromatogram. So chromatogram is not a mass spectrum. On the x-axis, you're plotting retention time. So it's the time that it took for them to come out of the column. The response is just, well, a generic signal. Liquid chromatography is a little bit different. Here, we're using a liquid to pump our sample through the column. The column itself is usually a lot shorter. So it's like a, a piece of steel tubing, maybe like 10 to 30 centimeters long. And our sample is, again, going to be a liquid, but it's usually solutes dissolved into that liquid. And it goes into some robotic system. So you're seeing the pump, the injector, all of those parts. I think the most important part that I want to talk about here is the injector, because with HPLC, it stands for high pressure liquid chromatography. So the whole system's under pressure. And what you're seeing here is a way of directly switching the valve that sort of keeps that pressure locked in to allow a small quantity of our sample to get looped in and pushed down the column. So as it's making its way down the column, we're gonna see that separation taking place. The process of separation within the column is pretty much the same as gas chromatography, where it's either being carried in the, gap, in the liquid phase now, or it's dragging along onto the stationary phase. Ultimately, this is an equilibrium. So we call this a partitioning, where it favors one solvent or the column phase. And you can see that there will be a separation between them as well. What you're seeing over here is a commercial instrument, an Agilent HPLC system. I have one like this in my lab. This isn't my lab, but it looks just like this. We can see that we can mix and match different solvents to kind of adjust the polarity and allow different molecules to elute. That's the pump system, and the tubing allows us to mix up to four different solvents and direct the, the flow accordingly. And that's our auto sampler. So each of those vials represents some of our sample. And there's kind of this pincher arm that works its way, grabs one of those vials. And you can see a needle in there. So the, the needle will pierce that red septum and draw up a quantity of sample, maybe five microliters or something like that. Then it works its way down the tube and into the column. In this case, the column is, is attached to a heater so we can control the temperature. It's not as important in gas chromatography. We're actually evaporating the molecules but it's, it's still important. And now you're seeing a coupling between HPLC and mass spectrometry on the far end. So just to kind of demonstrate how the, the scale of these things might look, these are pretty big benchtop instruments. So we say they're like microwave they're dishwasher size. Even what's underneath the bench there is important. That's the pumping mechanism, because all of this is under vacuum. So these are pretty hefty instruments. There's like, they take a fair amount of bench space and a lot of training to get really good at uh, using them. There you go. That was a quick tour of GC and LC, but just to kind of get the basics of it. Now, just to kind of talk about, well, when would you use what? I mean, I guess to summarize it, compounds that are easily placed in the gas phase, might as well use GC. If it tends to not evaporate that easy, might as well use LC. Now you could think, well, some molecules, they're very volatile, they evaporate, no trouble. Others, not so much. Water is a good example. It, it, you've got to boil it pretty high, uh, 100 degrees Celsius, before it evaporates. And why is that? 
because water, like a lot of other molecules, have hydrogen bonding. So that's what's kind of gluing these molecules together. So compounds that, that, inert, that exhibit this hydrogen bonding network are much less volatile and therefore much less suitable for GC. So you might think LC is the obvious choice. However, we can take advantage of derivatization chemistry. So all we really need to do here is convert like the OH group into some other compound that doesn't have that hydrogen bonding. And these are all kind of commercial reagents that you can buy. And it's, I call it like one pot chemistry. This is, this is done for the analytical chemist. You don't need to be a synthetic chemist to do these types of reactions. They're quick, they're high yield, and they produce a different compound. So not only is the different compound at a different mass, which is kind of obvious, but it might exhibit a different retention time as well. But the net effect is that by derivatizing compounds, they become more suitable for GCMS. They produce better sensitivity, and we can even take advantage of, of tagging the, the uh, reagents, those derivatizing agents, with specific residues that allow us to detect our compounds even easier. Now I didn't mention like after GC, how do you actually put the two together? How do you have a GCMS system? And it's really, really straightforward because with GC, the capillary that we have is a really skinny tube. The gas that's flowing in there is kind of minimal. It's sweeping along the analyte with it. Of course, mass spectrometry works in a vacuum. Now, it actually would overwhelm the pumping system of mass spec if we just blew all of the gas directly into the mass spec. So what we have is these intermediate pumps that kind of suck out most of the background. So if our gas is like helium, it's a very light gas, so it actually blows down and sucked into the pump, and it kind of in enriches the concentration of our analyte. That just helps to maintain the vacuums of mass spec. So the coupling of LC to mass spectrometry was, was actually a long story on that. It was like they, in, in the 70s and 80s, it was a difficult process to do. It was like all this solvent that's going to evaporate and overwhelm the pump. How do we get rid of it? And the solution in the end was electrospray ionization. Seems obvious now, but that was actually a Nobel Prize to be able to couple these two devices together through electrospray ionization. So what you're seeing here is the idea of like the charge nebulization. You produce these little bubbles and then they shrink in again. Tell you what, we will save this for now. We'll talk about it in much detail later. I did mention that the salt is, is a thing to avoid, but we will talk about this later. So what I do want to talk about now is the different types of ways that you can display the data when you're talking about LCMS or GCMS or LC tandem. MS. Now there's GC tandem MS as well, but we'll kind of focus on, on the second one. So you see the different kinds of chromatograms that we display here. And by the way, the middle one, this reconstructed ion chromatogram, sometimes people call it extracted ion chromatogram as well. You'll see those two words flipping around. So let's walk through each of these things and I'll kind of give you a sense of what the data would look like and why it's important to have these different types of data processing. Okay, so imagine that we have our LC-MS system. We've got the column, LC pumps, and the mass spectrometer on the back end, and a sample. The sample is going to contain like all kinds of different things. So maybe that's like all the metabolites that are floating around in a, in a plasma matrix. So like very, very complicated system. You can imagine then that if we're going to do analysis of it, there's going to be all kinds of data being revealed. How do we display that data? What are we looking at? Well, the easiest way is to display what we would call a total ion chromatogram. So there's not much information in it. It's sort of a blurb. It doesn't even seem like compounds are separated because one thing is eluding and then the next one's coming out right on top of it. But inside of this chromatogram, there's tons of information. And of course, remember, this is on a computer. So like you can do these types of clinks. So imagine now I'm interested in that signal over there. So like what happened in that one second when right now I'm just displaying like kind of a generic peak. Well, inside that one second, there is a mass spectrum. So I can plot out the entire mass spectrum. And in that mass spectrum, I might have multiple different compounds. That sort of explains why the chromatogram wasn't clean. There was like multiple things that were coming out at once. There might be a thousand, 10,000 compounds separating. So there's not enough space for them to completely resolve from one another. So that's the mass spectrum that we'd get there. Now, how did we display like the red chromatographic trace? Well, what we do is we take all these ions and just add them all up. 
We're even going to add up the background ions because there's so many of them, but they will add up. So you take that intensity and that intensity plus that plus that. You sum every single one of them together, and you're going to get one number. So that one number is what you plot as your total ion intensity. So every mass spectrum is reduced to a single data point. And of course, I have, I don't know, like a thousand of these. It depends how fast we're acquiring the data, but you might be able to acquire a mass spectrum at a rate of like 20 per second. So you can imagine over the course of, let's say an hour, there's a lot of data inside here. Anyways, a new mass spectrum would show up at a, at a new time, and more than likely, it would be different than the one that we saw before it. So if you compare the two, then yeah, you'll see a difference between them. So that's what our total ion chromatogram gives us. It's, it's like one picture, but really in the computer, all the mass spectra are stored. Now what I want to do is display it in different ways. So let's say I'm interested in just one particular mass. So I see that ion right there. It has an M over Z of 420. Down in the other spectrum, maybe a little bit, but like definitely not the same. So my question is, how does the profile of that ion alone, the M over Z 420, happen over the course of time? Well, I can just type this into my computer and say, I don't want you to plot me the total mass signal, just plot me the signal of 420, maybe plus or minus a half. So this would show up. The signal would drop down, but you get like cleaner spectra. So you see like where 420 actually came out, boom, you get this nice huge signal. And then there's like a couple of other stragglers. So it's like, why are we seeing 420 at multiple times? The spectrum is so complicated, or our mixture is so complicated, there just happens to be multiple molecules that have the same mass. They all weigh 420. So they're showing up at different times. So this is what we call an extracted ion chromatogram. You could create multiple extracted ion chromatograms, one at every single mass that you wish. All right, let's visit the idea of a quadrupole again. So this is important when it comes to the, the next scan mode that we do. Now remember with a quadrupole, the idea is that we're filtering our ions. So if we have a whole bunch of different ions and I wanna record a mass spectrum, what I need to do is allow that quadrupole to scan from one mass to the next one to the next one. But here I'm only interested in mass 420. So what I can do is set the quadrupole to just sit on that mass. So I've tuned the voltages to be just right that says 420, you go through, everything else does not. So when I do that, this mass spectrometer is optimizing the signal, or, or I should say more specifically, the signal to noise. When I'm looking to scan through and look at all the other ions, I'm not spending very much time looking at the compound that I'm interested in, looking at 420. So that creates more noise, or less signal, and we don't get as good of a spectrum that we want. So what we're doing here is we're selecting that ion. We're doing so in the mass spectrometer. We're not selecting it post-run. We're not selecting it from the data. We're selecting the mass spectrometer to do that experiment. Now what we will see will be essentially the same as the extracted ion chromatogram, but if you notice the green trace, we're seeing a higher signal to noise. So that's the enhancement that we're getting by tuning the mass spectrometer to only look at that one ion. The disadvantage of that is that this is the only data that we've recorded. So no longer can we query that green trace and say, well, show me another ion, show me the total ion chromatogram. That information would be lost to us. However, if this is all we care about, we might as well get us the best signal intensity that we can. All right, what about the case where we happen to have a tandem mass spectrometer? Well, we can use that to get even more selectivity. So what we got here is our triple quad instrument. And let's just take two hypothetical molecules. I'll still take with, with 420, but I'm gonna say that they're two different molecules. So just, you know, triangles and circles. If I were to fragment that molecule, because they're different, I'm assuming that the fragment ions will also have different masses as well. So let's say I'm interested in the, the red one, okay? So I can select the masses in the quadrupoles to correspond to the parent mass and the fragment mass, which means that this ion, if it tried to get through, it would get stuck. The second quadrupole would filter it out. But the ion that I am interested in, it sort of goes right through, and the detector is on that end, so that's the only place where we'll actually be able to see it. So what we've done right here is we found a way to enhance our signal even further. The noise is going down to kind of nothing here. 
This is what we would call selected reaction monitoring, and we always label it with the, the parent mass and the product mass, so this 420 to 212. We call that an MSMS -MS transition. And finally, of course, if we can do it with one mass, we could do it with others. So quadrupoles and triple quadrupoles, they operate extremely quickly. If I was interested in both compounds, I could select different masses in, in all instances. And what I can do is just kind of quickly oscillate between top and bottom. You could do this like every second. You could do this multiple of these 10 different transitions every second. And by doing that, we're allowed to look at different compounds because of their different masses, kind of all simultaneously. So in this type of chromatogram, what you will see is sort of a way of, of appearing just the two compounds that we want to see. Uh, we can even distinguish one from the other. So each of the transition is labeled uh, according to the, the precursor mass and the product mass that we've observed. So yeah, a lot of different ways of displaying data, of, of kind of enriching our chromatograms to be able to see signals and move away from other signals. So this kind of all gets into the idea of using the instrumentation to our advantage to just be able to detect compounds that we want and avoid seeing the compounds that we don't. So by enhancing the selectivity, by enhancing sensitivity, we create a better analytical platform. LCMS and GCMS are synonymous with analytical characterization, especially when we're dealing with mixtures. So that's all I got for you today. See you around.